If, as Karl Marx said, labor in a white skin can never be free as long as labor in black skin is branded, it was also true that the democratic struggles of the times, especially the fight for women's equality, could be most effectively waged in association with the struggle for black liberation. Today, I want to talk about Angela Davis's Women, Race, and Class. This book was written in 1983 and is mostly a history of specific moments about women's rights, labor struggles, and racism in the U.S. Overall, I enjoyed reading it, although reading the history of racism, sexism, and capitalist exploitation in the U.S. can be uh, uncomfortable, I think it is important to discuss. Uh, the specific theme I want to talk about is how our movements are focused. So people across the political spectrum will criticize movements as about worrying too much at once, to worry about too much at once. Historically, women's rights movement has left racism and capitalism out of its analysis, which has given rise to those girl boss memes that you see on the internet mocking that kind of idea. Uh, movements for black liberation, like Black Lives Matter, will get criticized because they're anti-capitalist, and a lot of people think that black capitalism has the power to end racism. Uh, socialists can become so focused on the class struggle that they discard anti-sexism and anti-racism as distractions. Uh, but my thesis in this video is that a narrow focus on one particular issue may seem like a pragmatic way to bring many people together, but in reality it harms your movement. It may seem that, for example, a women's rights march with no official stance on capitalism would be able to bring people together with a variety of views on capitalism, or that an anti-racist campaign that doesn't ex discuss sexism might be successful at attracting liberals and conservatives. But the history discussed in Davis's Women, Race, and Class demonstrates that a narrow focus on one specific issue, instead of bringing people together, alienates people uh, who could be central to progressing your goals. Instead, what we need is a movement that analyzes issues with a broad lens that includes women's rights, anti-racism, anti-capitalism. And while those three areas are the focus of women, race, and class, uh, we might want to include more like anti-speciesism, disability rights, immigrant rights, and other forms of oppression in our analysis. And while the book doesn't talk about those issues specifically, I think the historical examples Davis uses are helpful in proving the same point about those struggles. So our first example is Prudence Crandall. She's a white school teacher in Canterbury, Connecticut, who started accepting black girls into her school. The Canterbury townspeople countered by passing a resolution in opposition to her plans, which proclaimed that the government of the United States, the nation with all its institutions of right, belonged to the white men who possessed them. No doubt they did mean white men quite literally. For Prudence Crandall had not only violated their code of racial segregation, she had also defied the traditional attitudes concerning the conduct of a white lady. Similar to Prudence Crandall, Mertilla Minor literally risked her life as she sought to impart knowledge to young black women. In 1851, when she initiated her project to establish a black teacher's college in Washington, D.C., she had already instructed black children in Mississippi, a state where education for blacks was a criminal offense. So Davis lauds the solidarity between white and black women in the education movement, especially since education was and is such a powerful tool for liberation. It was the willingness of white women and black women to work together against illiteracy that strengthened the black liberation movement. Uh, in the 19th century, white women were leading the abolitionist struggle. As they worked within the abolitionist movement, white women learned about the nature of human oppression, and in the process also learned important lessons about their own subjugation. In asserting their right to oppose slavery, they protested sometimes overtly, sometimes implicitly, 
their own exclusion from the political arena. They discovered that sexism, which seemed unalterable inside their marriages, would, could be questioned and fought in the arena of political struggle. Yes, white women would be called upon to defend fiercely their rights as women in order to fight for the emancipation of black people. This story of Prudence Crandall and Myrtilla Minor, as well as those stories about Lucretia Mott and Maria Chapman Weston, demonstrated how male supremacy could also be wielded as a tool for white supremacy. These white women saw the oppression of black people and decided to fight it with the resources that they had. They had, and through that struggle, their own oppression was revealed. Uh, the women learned the boundaries of how male supremacy shaped their lives, as well as tactics that would help them in the women's rights campaign. The Grimke sisters, Sarah and Angelina, are a great example of this. Davis describes how the Grimkeys consistently connected slavery and the oppression of women together. However, neither Sarah nor Angelina had originally been concerned, at least not expressly, about questioning the social inequality of women. Their main priority had been to expose the inhuman and immoral essence of the slave system and the special responsibility women bore for its perpetuation. But once the male supremacist attacks against them were unleashed, they realized that unless they defended themselves as women and the rights of women in general, they would forever be barred from the campaign to free the slaves. So here we come upon the first reason why we should have this broad scope. White women, by fighting for the abolition of slavery, discovered the depths of their own oppression. This led these women to realize that their fight must be for the abolition of slavery and women's rights. Abolition of slavery needed women's rights and women's rights movements were informed by the fight to abolish slavery. Without one, the other was weakened. But this move to broaden the scope was opposed by some of the abolitionist men. Davis says, But some of the leading men in the abolitionist campaign claimed that the issue of women's rights would confuse and alienate those who were solely concerned about the defeat of slavery. But Angela Grimke responded to their concerns, and she says, We cannot push abolitionism forward with all our might until we take up the stumbling block out of the road. What then can women do for the slave when she herself is under the feet of man and shamed into silence? So, instead of this push for women's rights alienating abolitionist men, it actually ended up having the opposite effect. It included abolitionist men into the women's rights movement. If you read this book, you'll see that Angela Davis is a Frederick Douglass stan. And with good reason, Frederick Douglass was one of the first men to agitate for women's suffrage and equality, and he was amazed by his friend Elizabeth Cady Stanton's intellectual arguments and wisdom, and so she was able to thoroughly convince him to join the women's equality movement. Uh, the famous Seneca Falls Convention, organized by Stanton and Lucretia Mott, was the first women's rights convention. Mott and others involved in the convention were worried that a proposal for women's suffrage would be too radical, and even Stanton's husband refused to attend because she insisted on pressing that issue. Damn, be less jingly. But Davis tells us that the suffrage resolution, while not unanimously endorsed, was only brought up at all because Frederick Douglass supported it. And when Douglass later defended the women's suffrage at the National Convention of Color Treatment, it was extremely popular. Davis criticized the Seneca Falls Convention and the early women's rights movement for not discussing all women. The Seneca Falls Declaration was not thinking about our book's title, Women, Race, and Class. If the recognition accorded working women at the Seneca Falls meeting was all but negligible, there was not even a cursory mention of another group of women. While at least one black man was present among the Seneca Falls conferees, there was not a single black woman in attendance, nor did the convention's documents make even a passing reference to black women. And this contradiction led up to the women's convention in 1851. This is where Sojourner Truth deliver delivered her famous Ain't I a Woman speech that inspired the title of Bell Hooks' book, uh, Ain't I a Woman. 
Truth speech is powerful, but its implication for women's solidarity across racial and class lines was even more evident when you know the context. Men who were hostile to the women's rights campaign had infiltrated the meeting and were aggressively male supremacists, according to Davis. They said women were too weak to even walk over a puddle without a man. Sojourner Truth points out, however, that those arguments can't even hold water in the context of working class and black women. I have plowed and planted and gathered into barns, and no man could head me. And ain't I a woman? I could work as much and eat as much as a man, when I could get it, and bear the lash as well. And ain't I a woman? I have borne thirteen children and seen them most all sold off to slavery. And when I cried out with my mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me. And ain't I a woman? No, come on. This speech is an especially powerful example of how too narrow a focus can hurt a cause. Before Truth spoke, many women at the convention were opposed to having a black woman speak and actively encouraged the leaders to prevent Truth from getting on the stage. But what more forceful argument against the idea that women are the weaker sex than the struggle of a black woman? Ironically, while white women suffragists feared that black men would join the patriarchy, Black women suffragists enjoyed the support of many of their men. Just as black man Frederick Douglass had been the most outstanding male advocate of women's equality during the 19th century, so W.E.B. Du Bois emerged as the leading male advocate of women's suffrage in the 20th century. Du Bois often would mock white men's hostility towards white women as the glorious tra tradition of Anglo-Saxon manhood. And uh, in addition to Douglas and Du Bois, Davis also cites Charles W. Chestnut, Reverend Francis J. Grimke, uh, Benjamin Brawley, the Honorable Robert H. Terrell, and all as supporters of women's suffrage. And as we will see in the next part, this reveals that white women suffragists lost a powerful ally in their struggle by accepting racism into their cause. So after emancipation, Black people's economic situation forced them into very similar jobs as they had performed under slavery. But more and more, black women ended up working as domestics. Whereas previously, black men and women mostly worked in the field side by side, as black people moved north, black women were especially coerced into domestic work. And white employers actually preferred to hire black servants over white ones because of the stereotypes at the time of black people as faithful, trustworthy, and grateful menial servants. And this gave rise to those stereotypes like Aunt Jemima and other demeaning things in the US media. So this meant that racism towards black women ended up hurting other women as well, especially immigrant women. Racism and sexism frequently converge and the condition of white women workers is often tied to the oppressive predicament of women of color. Thus, wages received by white women domestics have always been fixed by the racist criteria used to calculate the wages of black women servants. Immigrant women compelled to accept household employment earned little more than their black counterparts. As far as their wage earning potential was concerned, they were closer by far to their black sisters than to their white brothers who worked for a living. So this clearly meant that there was a need for a labor movement that cared about black women, since their exploitation impacted the rights of all working class people. Traditional labor unions in the late 1800s were male dominated and only begrudgingly acknowledged the contributions of working women. However, the National Colored Labor Union founded in 1869, accepted women into its ranks from the very beginning. And like the labor unions, socialist and communist parties started out very male and white. However, Davis cites the Marxist Socialist Party and the International Workers of the World as early supporters of women's equality. And it was the IWW that also adopted the anti-racist line. Davis devotes an entire chapter to short biographies of communist women who were active in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And her first example is Lucy Parsons. 
Although she was a black woman, Parsons' main focus was on the class struggle. In her eyes, black people and women did not suffer special forms of oppression, and there was no real need for mass movements to oppose racism and sexism explicitly. Sex and race, according to Parsons' theory, were facts of existence manipulated by employers who sought to justify their greater exploitation of women and people of color. Well, you might believe that this kind of undermines my thesis, and that which is that we cannot be narrowly focused, but we must take, make a movement that overthrows all forms of oppression. But I actually think that Parsons proves my point. Parsons' actions show that she was willing to work with groups that struggled against all forms of oppression. And unlike Susan B. Anthony, who we'll talk about later, Parsons acknowledged that black oppression was an issue and that women's oppression was an issue, but she saw those as growing out of something else. Uh, she saw herself as fighting against these forms of oppression, and instead of laying them off to the side for later, she saw the web that all these oppressions were part of, and she focused on what she saw as the source. Uh, compare that to later Anthony, who, will, who saw all those oppressions as disconnected struggles, where you could sacrifice one piece in order to achieve the other. Lucy Parsons' story and the biographies of the, all the communist women that Davis portrays demonstrates how movements aimed at ending oppression can grow. Ella Reeve Glore and Elizabeth Gurley Flynn uh, joined the Black Liberation struggle through their association with the Communist Party. Anita Whitney joined the Communist struggle while fighting for women's suffrage. Claudia Jones found the Communist Party while fighting for the, to free the Scottsboro Nine. So instead of alienating these powerful and influential women, the wide scope of these movements brought them into the fight for everyone's liberation. Uh, for each person that we lose, we add more powerful allies. This first part shows the success that we can achieve when we care about the different types of oppression. It shows that it's possible to care about multiple things at once, and that doing so improves our analysis and increases our number and helps more people. In this next part, we will see the dangers of adopting the opposite view, uh, that by being too narrowly focused, we can actually harm our movement. Of course, the Republicans did not lend their support to women's suffrage after the Union victory was won. But it was not so much because they were men, it was rather because, as politicians, they were beholden to the dominant economic interests of the period. The Civil War was a war to overthrow the Southern slave-owning class. It was a war which had been basically conducted in the interests of the Northern bourgeoisie. The northern capitalists sought economic control over the entire nation. Their struggle against the southern slaveocracy did not therefore mean they supported the liberation of black men or women as human beings. So in the first part of this video, we saw how white women were a large part of the abolitionist movement. Um, and when Republicans came to power, many white women threw their support behind them. However, we should be highly skeptical of any political party that claims to be anti-racist, but not anti-capitalist or anti-sexist. Uh, when we do not care about all forms of oppression, our fight for liberation is limited by male supremacist or capitalist interests. Uh, had people taken a closer look at the racist and capitalist interests of the Republicans, uh, they would have realized that black people had only attained their freedom nominally. While the chains of slavery had been broken, black people still suffered the pain of economic deprivation and they faced the terrorist violence of racist mobs in a form whose intensity was unmatched even by slavery. So Elizabeth Cady Stanton and her friend Susan B. Anthony didn't have this analysis. When the Republicans won the war and then betrayed the women's movement who helped build that party and ignored their demands, uh, Stanton and Anthony actually blamed black people. Uh, the women's movement, encouraged by white men, started seeing black liberation struggles as a threat to their movement. Uh, many became convinced that black people had become, if they became equal to white people, then black men would join the, that patriarchy and then that would make the women's oppressors even stronger. And so it's here that we see the connection between male supremacy, capitalism, and white supremacy. Susan B. Anthony's later betrayal of the Black Liberation Movement is made even sadder by the fact that she was really close with a lot of influential Black people. 
She was close with Frederick Douglass and Ida B. Wells, and unfortunately her narrow focus led her to push her friends out of the women's suffrage movement. She says to Wells about Douglass, When the Suffrage Association went to Atlanta, Georgia, knowing the feeling of the South with regard to Negro participation on equality with whites, I myself asked Mr. Douglass not to come. I did not want to subject him to humiliation, and I did not want anything to get in the way of bringing the Southern white women into our Suffrage Association. This is a really revealing quote from Anthony. Uh, she was willing to push black people aside in order to get white women on her side, but she wasn't willing to push racists aside in order to get black women. Her acceptance of racists into the ranks of the women's suffrage movement gave a platform, gave the platform to a lot of racist ideas, which led to further justification for the lynchings and Jim Crow laws that came after the Hayes betrayal. Uh, again, the narrow focus on women's suffrage didn't lead to some kind of broader coalition, but actually encouraged the further oppression of black people while not moving the struggle for women's suffrage forward. Davis says, If people of color, at home and abroad, were portrayed as incompetent barbarians, women, white women that is, were more rigorously depicted as mother figures, whose fundamental raison d'etre was the nurturing of the male of the species. White women were learning that as mothers, they bore a very special responsibility in the struggle to safeguard white supremacy. After all, they were the mothers of the race. I include this quote because it shows how white women's racist attitudes further perpetuated the idea that they must stay at home and be mothers. They needed to continue the white race, uh, and their fight for women's liberation was antithetical to that. And once again, not being anti-racist harmed the movement. In 1899, many black women had been left or been pushed out of the women's suffrage movement. And one of those women who remained was Lottie Wilson Jackson. During her trip to the convention, Lottie Jackson had suffered the indignities of the railroad segregationist policies. Her resolution was very simple that colored women ought not be compelled to ride in smoking cars, and that a suitable accommodations could be provided for them. However, this revealed another of Susan B. Anthony's biases. When she responded, we women are a helpless disenfranchised class, our hands are tied. While we are in this condition, it is not for us to go passing resolutions against railroad corporations or anybody else. We can see that just as Anthony was unwilling to fight for black people, she was also unwilling to go up against the capitalist class. And that reveals that the women's suffrage movement, Anthony, saw the vote as an end in itself, and they weren't really interested in how they might use that vote as a tool of liberation. Anthony's bourgeois bias was pretty evident from early on. And she was excluded from the 1969 convention of the National Labor Union because she had urged women printers to go work as scabs. And her justification was that while working men were being oppressed by the capitalists, it was not as a grain of sand on the seashore compared to the oppression of women. Uh, and she even later went on to say that the worst enemies of women's suffrage will ever be the laboring classes of men. So Anthony's narrow focus on women's suffrage blinded her to the fact that working men who exercise their right to vote continue to be miserably exploited by their wealthy employers. Political equality did not open the door to economic equality. That's a quote from David. Davis says it perfectly when she says, Anthony's staunchly feminist position was also a staunch reflection of bourgeois ideology, and it was probably because of the ideology's blinding powers that she failed to realize that working class women and black women alike were fundamentally linked to their men by the class exploitation and racist oppression which did not discriminate between the sexes. While their men's sexist behavior definitely needed to be challenged, the real enemy, their common enemy, was the boss, the capitalist, or whoever was responsible for the miserable wages and unbearable working conditions and for the racist and sexist discrimination on the job. But Susan B. Anthony was not the only Susan who was 
seemed kind of ignorant about capitalism's influence upon women. When discussing what's called the myth of the black rapist, Davis demonstrates how this racist myth was perpetuated by Susan Brown Miller and others and misdirected the anti-rape movement. Davis explains, The myth of the black rapist continues to carry out the insidious work of racist ideology. It must bear a good portion of the responsibility for the failure of most anti-rape theorists to seek the identity of the enormous numbers of anonymous rapists who remain unreported, untried, and unconvicted. The anonymity surrounding the vast majority of rapes is a consequently treated as a statistical detail or else a mystery whose meaning is inaccessible. As those who are following the hashtag MeToo movement might remember, there was a certain group of people who were able to get away with rape and sexual assault with impunity. Davis continues, But why are there so many anonymous rapists in the first place? Might not this anonymity be a privilege enjoyed by men whose status protects them from prosecution? Although white men who are employers, executives, politicians, doctors, professors, etc. have been known to take advantage of women they consider their social inferiors, their sexual mixed deeds seldom come to light in court. Is it not, therefore, quite probable that these men of the capitalist and middle classes account for a significant proportion of those unreported rapes? It seems, in fact, that men of the capitalist class and their middle class partners are immune to prosecution because they commit their sexual assaults with the same unchallenged authority that legitimizes their daily assaults on the labor and dignity of working people. So it is clear that when we remove the veil of racism, that it is not black men who rape women, but just men in general, Davis connects how male supremacy and capitalist exploitation are Together. Working class men, whatever their color, can be motivated to rape by the belief that their maleness accords them the privilege to dominate women. Yet since they do not possess the social or economic authority, unless it is a white man raping a woman of color guaranteeing them immunity from prosecution, the incentive is not nearly as powerful as it is for the men of the capitalist class. When working class men accept the invitation to rape extended by the ideology of male supremacy, they are accepting a bribe, an illusory compensation for their powerlessness. The class structure of capitalism encourages men who wield power in the economic and political realm to become routine agents of sexual exploitation. Although I hope my point's been made, I do have one more example from Women, Race, and Class that I think is really illustrative. Illustrative? Illustrative. Anyways. It is the racist history of reproductive rights. So the reproductive rights movement is, in my opinion, one of the most important places where a broad scope that includes gender, race, and class is really useful. Also, it should take into account basically every oppressed identity, like disabilities, LGBT+, immigrant, and speciesism, uh, all these communities in its analysis and its movement. Uh, I think the example of how the reproductive rights and black community have interacted is actually a really great example for all of those different identities. Why were self-imposed abortions and reluctant acts of infanticide such common occurrences during slavery? Not because black women had discovered solutions to their predicament, but rather because they were desperate. Abortions and infanticides were acts of desperation, motivated not by the biological birth process, but by the oppressive conditions of slavery. So the right to control one's reproductive system, which includes the right to birth control and abortions, is a really important right. And although this is a position that's held by the majority of people in the US, I still kind of wish it was more widely accepted. No one should be forced to use their body as a life support system for someone else, even if they had sex. But Davis asks us not to forget why people have abortions and why we advocate for them. During the early abortions rights campaign, it was too frequently assumed that legal abortions provided a viable alternative to the myriad problems posed by poverty. As if having fewer children could create more jobs, higher wages, better schools, etc, etc. 
The campaign often failed to provide a voice for women who wanted the right to legal abortions while deploring the social conditions that prohibited them from bearing more children. Unfortunately, we often hear people advocating for abortion rights because of overpopulation. I see this a lot in like the comments section of news articles about abortion rights in the US or something else. Some people believe that problems like climate change, pollution, poverty, unemployment, and other social justice issues are because there are too many people. But we gotta remember that these issues are not caused by overpopulation, but by unequal distribution of resources. We have long known that there is enough food, housing, medicine, and other resources for everyone on the earth. And there's likely enough for billions more people. It's actually really absurd to believe that we should limit people's ability to have children before we limit the rights of private property in capitalism. Davis uses the example of Margaret Sanger, who is often known as a person who popularized the phrase birth control and who opened the first birth control clinic in the US. She's also infamous for supporting the eugenics movement. Her story is excellent proof that our movements require broad scope. Davis describes how initially Sanger was an anti-capitalist, but she was taken in by some poorly thought through positions. Sanger herself began to underestimate the centrality of capitalist exploitation in her analysis of poverty, arguing that too many children caused workers to fall into their miserable per predicament. Moreover, women were inadvertently perpetuating the exploitation of the working class, she believed, by continually flooding the labor market with new workers. This is such a terrible analysis of this situation. A better analysis would be almost a complete reverse. Uh, that capitalism incentivizes people to not have children because their children will eventually become competitors in the labor market. This analysis shows how capitalism attempts to limit workers' freedom over their reproductive system, while Sanger's analysis identifies workers exercising their right to have children as the problem. But it gets worse. When Margaret Sanger severed her ties with the Socialist Party for the purpose of building an independent birth control campaign, she and her followers became more susceptible than ever before to the anti-black and anti-immigrant propaganda of the time. The fatal influence of the eugenics movement would destroy the progressive potential of the birth control campaign. Once Margaret Sanger joins the eugenics movement, Davis provides some quotes from Sanger's writings. In an article published by Margaret Sanger in the American Birth Control League's journal, she defined the chief issue of birth control as more children from the fit, less from the unfit. She also says, let me find it. Margaret Sanger oft offered her public approval of this development. Morons, mental defectives, epileptics, illiterates, paupers, unemployables, criminals, prostitutes, and dope fiends ought to be surgically sterilized, she argued on a radio talk show. That's <laughs> pretty bad. But Davis also quotes from others in the reproductive rights movement who were influenced by, by Margaret Sanger. Guy Irving Birch advocated birth control as a weapon to prevent the American people from being replaced by alien or Negro stock, whether it be by immigration or by overly high birth rates among others in this country. Which is pretty racist. There's also, let me find this one. The Birth Control Federation of America planned a Negro project. In the Federation's wor words, the mass of Negroes, particularly in the South, still breed carelessly and disastrously, with the result that the increase among Negroes, even more than among whites, is from that portion of the population least fit and least able to bear rear children properly. Again, wow, very racist. As we can see, when the birth control movement lost its class and racial analysis, it fell easily into these kind of horrible ideas. But don't think that it was just the early 1900s that where eugenics was a feature of the movement. It was a feature of the 1970s movement as well. 
Throughout the 20th century, up until the 1980s, there was a highly racialized forced sterilization campaign in the US. Doctors across the country performed sterilizations on young women, the majority of whom were black. Some women were sterilized without their knowledge, others were coerced. Niall Ruth Cox, for example, filed suit against the state of North Carolina. At the age of 18, eight years before the suit, officials had threatened to discontinue their family's welfare payments if she refused to submit to surgical sterilization. Davis goes into detail about North Carolina's sterilization statistics. Under the auspices of the Eugenics Commission of North Carolina, so it was learned, 7,686 sterilizations had been carried out since 1933. Although the operations were justified as measures to prevent the reproduction of mentally deficient persons, about 5,000 of the sterilized persons had been black. I just want to remind you that this happened up until the 1980s. This is like Gen X that we were talking about. These people in my parents' generation. And by the way, forced sterilization counts as genocide according to the UN's definition. But of course, genocide against black people isn't the only genocide that the US has committed. The domestic population policy of the US government has an undeniably racist edge. Native American, Chicanan, Puerto Rican, and black women continue to be sterilized in disproportionate numbers. Davis cites a lot of statistics about the percentages of people who are sterilized. 20% of all married black women in 1970, 35% of all Puerto Rican women, etc. These statistics are extremely sad, but I think you kind of can research this on your own. The point for our purposes is the government funded sterilizations of people of color for decades, up to and including the time that this book was written. The prevalence of sterilization abuse during the latter 1970s may be greater than ever before. Although the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare issued guidelines in 1974, which were ostensibly designed to prevent involuntary sterilizations, the situation has nonetheless deteriorated. When the ACLU's Reproductive Freedom Project conducted a survey of teaching hospitals in 1975, they discovered that 40% of those institutions were not even aware of the regulations issued by Hugh. Only 30% of the hospitals examined by the ACLU were even attempting to comply with the guidelines. The reason I'm spending a long time on this particular topic is not just because it is horrible and not really frequently talked about, a case of racial centered genocides that was funded by the US government, but because it puts the reproductive rights movement into context. We see how poverty and welfare is used as a coercive tool for sterilizing poor and working class people of color. Here's another telling example. As a result of the 1977 Hyde Amendment passed by Congress, federal funds for abortions were eliminated in all cases but those involving rape and the risk of death or severe illness. There have been many more victims, women for whom sterilization has become the only alternative to the abortions, which are currently beyond their reach. Sterilizations continue to be federally funded and free to poor women on demand. Nowadays, most private insurances and Medicaid still cover sterilization procedures, and mostly for women, although some are available for men. Rates of sterilization are higher among Black and Hispanic women, as well as poor women. And you shouldn't take these facts as an indication that we should limit people's reproductive rights and make it more difficult for people to get sterilized. A better analysis would be that we should expand the choices that people have. This means that making abortions more accessible to people of color and to poor people, so they don't have to choose between never having a child and just not having a child right now. This also means that we need to make it easier to have children financially and socially. And this means making childcare cheaper or free, building support systems for people who want to have children, improving our education system, and everything else. In short, it means addressing basically every other social injustice that people actually, so that people actually feel that they have a choice. Davis concludes this chapter. Within organizations representing the interest of middle-class white women, there has been a certain reluctance to support the demands of the campaign against sterilization abuse. For these women are often denied their individual rights to be sterilized when they desire to take this step. While women of color are urged at every turn to become permanently infertile, white women enjoying prosperous economic conditions are urged by the same forces to reproduce themselves. 
They therefore sometimes consider the waiting period and other details of the demand for informed consent to sterilization as further inconveniences for women like themselves. So this quote reveals how racism towards people of color can come back around and hurt white people, and usually it's white women. But the reproductive rights movement of the 1980s wasn't willing to include racism into its analysis and thus hurt itself. As Davis says, the same, same forces that force sterilizations on black women are the forces that make it difficult for white women to get sterilizations when they desire it. So that example of the reproductive rights movement is just one example of how a broader scope is necessary for our social justice movements. We saw how movements that focused on white middle class women undermine themselves by ignoring issues like racism, classism, and capitalism. We saw how black liberation movements have improved by the hard work of the women in the movement and alienating these women will only cause harm. We see how the labor rights movement can attract more working class people into its cause by organizing around the issues affecting black people and women. A movement hyper-focused on one particular issue may seem pragmatic since people across this political spectrum can agree on that issue, but the history shows that instead of bringing diverse groups together, this type of narrow attention undermines the radical elements of the movement and is easily co-opted by oppressors and alienates the oppressed. We must fight for the liberation of all if we want liberation for anyone.